This is the Other 22 Hours Podcast. Hey, and welcome to the 50th episode of the Other 22 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron schaefer Hayes. And I'm your host, Michaela Ann, and this is the second year of our podcast, so we're so happy to be back, and thank you for being here with us. If you've been from the beginning, amazing. If this is your first time checking us out, welcome. Yeah, we are keenly aware that we couldn't get to 50 episodes without you guys here in any kind of way that's not extremely lame. So with that, we have a simple ask for you. Choose your own adventure, three different options. The easiest and fastest way is to just click subscribe or follow, whatever it's called, on your listening platform of choice. It's a great way to let the algorithm know that our show is worth putting in front of other people. The second one, if you have heard episodes before, is to take your favorite episode and pass it along to somebody that doesn't know what we do that might enjoy it. And then lastly, if you want to directly support what we're doing here, we have a community over on Patreon that we're really excited about. And you get the normal things like behind the scenes content, exclusive content. We have a great discussion going on over there. We announce our guests early. So it gives our community the chance to present questions that we will ask our guests during the show. And if you're interested, you can learn more at the link in the show notes below here or at the other 22 hours.com slash Patreon. And we are not music journalists. We are musicians ourselves. So we feel like because of that, we're able to go to some more personal and really interesting places in these conversations based on the shared experiences and honest realities of building a lifelong career around your art. And one of those honest realities is that there is so much that is just outside of our control in all of this. And so we like to focus on the things that are within our control, like our routines, our headspace, our habits. And we've distilled that down to a question that kind of underpins every episode without asking directly. And that is, what do you do to create sustainability in your life so that you can sustain your creativity? We asked that question today of Sierra Hall. Sierra Hall is basically one of the youngest bluegrass legends out there. She started picking up the mandolin at age eight, signing her first record deal at 13. And before her 20s, she had already performed at the White House in Carnegie Hall at the Grand Ole Opry. She's performed with all of the bluegrass legends, Alison Krauss, Ron Block, Sam Bush, Del McCory. She has quite a long resume. And as you would imagine, achieving so much at such a young age is an interesting experience. And she was so generous in sharing what some of those highs and lows are and how to keep the inspiration and keep on the path of creating music for the love of music. Yeah. One thing that I love about bluegrass culture or roots music culture, especially down here in the South being a born and raised Mainer, is how much it is just a part of life. Right off the bat in the episode, Sierra's talking about how her grandmother and her parents and her great aunt, like all just sang around the house and sang at church and it wasn't anything. None of them wanted to be on stage. It's just what they did and it was part of life. And that's a really beautiful approach to life from somebody that has spent too many years in very traditional music schooling But with that comes this kind of groundedness in her viewpoint of what's going on and her approach to everything that I felt really intriguing and really inspiring. Like Michaela said, she's really generous with a lot of her experiences and her wisdom here. And so we're going to stop babbling. And without further ado, here's our conversation with Sierra Hall. Well, thank you so much for being into doing this. We are excited to talk to you because like Aaron said, we've done 50 episodes and a lot of our guests have been kind of in the Americana world and we've had a couple of film composers and jazz musicians. But I was like, have we had a bluegrass musician? And then uh, remember that we had Alice Gerard. So- <laughs> Both ends of the spectrum. You and Alice Gerard <laughs> holding down it. our bluegrass hey, category. That's awesome. <laughs> well, that's good company to be in in my book. Yeah. So that's awesome. I know Jimmy kind of filled you in on the premise of this podcast. If we're not going deep on like, what was your inspiration for your record? We're talking about like how you take care of yourself and stay connected to your creativity. Activity, sanity. Your, yeah, sanity and humanity while doing this mm-hmm. for a lifetime. And you are definitely started the youngest. Mm-hmm. You had your first record deal at 13. Yeah. I'm getting old now, girl. You know, getting <laughs> old now. That felt like a long time ago. But yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess just to jump 
into the deep end. I'm so curious because a lot of what we talk about is maybe not all of us, but some of us have challenge of honoring and nurturing our identity outside of music, especially outside of our attachment to our quote unquote success or how we are received or perceived within the music world. Also, bluegrass to me from the outside looking in feels like such like a way of life beyond just I play music and I'm building a career. Can you speak to that? Has that ever come into play for you? Any kind of identity observations or challenges or maybe not challenges at all? Yeah, it is a little bizarre. I must say, because your words, a way of life. I mean, I feel like that's kind of how I got into music to start with is because I'm from here in Tennessee. Originally, I grew up two hours northeast of here, up near the Kentucky line, a little tiny town, no red light, less than a thousand people. Everybody knows everybody. I grew up singing in church and everybody from I always say my mom to my granny to her sister, my great aunt, like everybody just kind of sang. They weren't trying to be on a stage. I mean, no real performers in my family or anything, but music was kind of always around. My dad has always had a deep love of different kinds of music. My parents are pretty young, so like 80s rock and like trad bluegrass, you know, it was like a Mm -hmm. big range of things that they like to listen to. So my great uncle, my granny's brother-in-law, the great aunt I was speaking of there. So her husband played mandolin and fiddle and guitar and was just self-taught, wasn't some virtuosic musician, but was always had an instrument in his hand, you know, playing songs like Wildwood Flower on the guitar or just old hymns, church songs, you know. So my parents built a house right next to them just before I was born. So I grew up with them right there. So they were kind of like a second set of grandparents. So Mm -hmm. the instruments were familiar to me, always hearing, you know, mandolin, fiddle, guitar. My dad uh, eventually brought a guitar, one of Junior's guitars, down to our house, and he started learning to play some chords. And my brother and I would just sing together in church, and my dad would play guitar as we did. So it was really only when I was probably about seven that my dad at some point, like, brought a banjo home and, like, was trying to get my brother interested in bluegrass. Dad got bit by the bluegrass bug and started going to some of these jams, you know, within 30, 40 minutes of our house on the weekends. And so eventually he taught me a song on the mandolin, and I just kind of fell in love with that. So really, like, the idea of music has always just felt so a part of who I am when we talk about Mm -hmm. identity and, like, starting so young career-wise, too. This is all I've ever known. It's Mm -hmm. the only job I've ever had, and like, what a gift and a blessing to have that. But also, it was something I knew I wanted from the time I was probably like eight or nine years old when I started. I don't really remember a time where I didn't think this is what I want, and this is what my life is going to be for better or for worse. They say, if you can quit, you should. I've always felt this is all I've got, so I better like work hard and try to, you know, make the most of it. So, yeah, I do think as you mature and you grow older and you start to recognize the need to have an identity outside of that while at the same time feeling like so much of who I am and what my whole life has been about has also been wrapped up in this thing. You know, to choose the thing you love so much to be passionate about takes so much of yourself to invest into doing this as a career and the sort of emotional roller coaster one goes on. The highs are really high and the lows are real low, yeah. you know? <laughs> So, and I think we all experience that to various degrees, whether you're somebody a hundred times more successful than I am or people who are just starting out. It's There's that wave. And I think that's understanding that and coming to peace with that a little bit and mm-hmm. kind of learning to navigate that when you start thinking about having something in your career feel like it's not going well doesn't make you a worthless human. Yeah. Having something really great happen doesn't make you suddenly super cool. You know, it's a weird thing that you have to kind of balance. And especially in the day that we live in where, you know, everything's on social media and there's this need to constantly be giving ourselves to the thing mm-hmm. that we've chosen as a career. So that's a very long-winded answer, but... <laughs> no, it's a great yeah, answer. <laughs> absolutely. You know, I can vividly remember when I was like, oh, no, I want to be a musician for the rest of my life. You know, I was 11 or 12 or something like that. Like Music was part of my life. There was always instruments around the house. My parents weren't musicians or anything, but there was always instruments around, and I would play them and mess around with them. And, you know, as soon as there was, like, an opportunity to be in the band in school or play Sweet Home Alabama in my basement with my neighbor for, like, an hour straight, I was into it. But I definitely remember it being, like, when I grow up, I want to do this. Growing up in Maine, there wasn't a lot of opportunities. I toured, like, as much as I could, which was, like, in a really weird kind of jazz fusion trio in a Subaru outback to like various 
brick oven pizza places in Maine, <laughs> <laughs> playing to people who just happened to be there, not wanting to be there, you know? And so it was always this separation. And I feel like I'm still working to be like, oh, no, this is what I'm doing with my life rather than this is my life in a very weird way. As we sit here in my recording studio at my house, like it's simultaneously like a hard thing for me to wrap my head around this idea that it's just always been a thing. And also there's a little bit of like envy growing up in Maine, like coming down here and being in this culture down here and being at like a bunch of bluegrass parties where everybody's picking and just like the musicianship and the personality and people that just grow up making this music and it's not necessarily something that's like studies just like we just we sing with my my family sings and we sing in church and we sing at home and it's just like what we do is so real and so intoxicating to me as an outsider to that yeah and in a small town i mean i didn't we didn't have like a jazz program at school we didn't have some suzuki teacher Mm -hmm. close by or anything like that. It was very much you're sitting in mom's lap at four years old and she's like teaching you a little song. And then you might go to the local jam and start hearing like people in a circle play the music, you know, and they become Mm -hmm. your friends, you know, people three times my age, all these older guys that (laughs) welcomed me in. And I always say that was as much of what made me want to do it as the music itself was the community. So Mm -hmm. when we talk about the music being part of it, as a way of life, but also just these people that that's who they are and where they've come from, you know, being people that have played the music their whole lives, you know, welcoming a eight-year-old girl into the circle to say, sure, join us, you know. I feel really, really fortunate to have grown up so close to that kind of culture and atmosphere because I do think at the end of the day, Bluegrass is home base for me, but that community is a really special community to have been fortunate enough to grow up in. It's so interesting how our relationship to music is so informed by these outside things. Like I grew up in a military family, like not surrounded by musicians. And it was kind of always this outside thing like that you aspire to. And I didn't really know anything existed out of pop stardom. And it was a long winding road of figuring out how do you do this? And I'll never forget, we met in jazz conservatory in New York City. And jazz school was pretty brutal. Like Uh, Whiplash might as well be a documentary. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It was very much like oh, you think you can play? Come on stage and like, we're going to try and embarrass you. It felt very like, let's see your chops. And as a singer, it was very clearly like singers aren't musicians. So it was very dismissive and felt very demoralizing. I thought Mm. I hated music after being Uh. at jazz school. And then I discovered Michael Daves. Do you know Michael Daves? Yeah, of course. Good buddy. I just heard a girl talking about him in the hallway that she was taking private lessons from a bluegrass guitarist. And I was like, what? You can do that and the school will pay for it. And so I called up Michael Daves and started taking lessons from him. Aaron did as well. And Michael taught me how to play guitar. He was hugely informative in my life and introduced me to the New York bluegrass scene. And I was like, wait a second, you show up at a jam and everyone just assumes that you play. Like it was like, oh, what do you pick? What do you pick? Come on in. Not sizing you up. And it just immediately was like, oh, this is nice. And based on the assumption that everybody plays music, because again, it's a way of life. You go to a festival, it's half the audience is there to see some music, but I swear they're just as there to get ready for all the music to be over so they can go back to the campground yeah. and mm-hmm. jam, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and I know people that go to festivals and might watch a show on the main stage, but man, they're there to pick. They want to, yeah. you know, yeah. see their buddies and jam. And I lived for it as a kid. Like you said, everybody just playing something, whether you're just starting or or you've been doing it a long time, it's a nice thing to just have kind of that shared community where everybody's excited to be there and excited to get to share this experience together. And nine times out of 10, I would say a very welcoming, positive experience for Mm -hmm. most people. Can you talk about your experience coming from this scene, coming from this upbringing, very communal, very open? How was it going to Berkeley coming from that? Did you find the path kind of continued or was it jarring? What was your experience? I was scared to death because I wasn't planning on going to music school. It's the other side of the coin where you grow up in a community like that that doesn't talk about the technicalities of the music. I think people do more now, the Mm -hmm. younger generation, and it's the day and age of everything on the internet and schools Mm -hmm. like Berkeley being more established with having a roots program and things like that. But like, I just wanted to 
go on tour and make records. That was what I wanted to do. And so I had made my first album when I was in high school. And in my mind, I was just like, I'm finally going to not be a student, graduate and hit the road and start building a career in that regard. But when I was a sophomore, someone from Berkeley reached out and said, hey, we saw this video of you playing. And if you're considering music school, we hope you'll come here and we can guarantee you a full tuition. And so I was just like, man, that's really cool. But in a way, even then, I didn't know what Berkeley was. It's embarrassing to even say it coming from a small town. Like my parents don't have a college education. Actually, like until my cousins and I, our generation, no one in my family on either side really had been to college. You know, it's just Mm -hmm. like a bunch of Appalachian rural people who work hard and, (laughs) you know, like Mm -hmm. it's not that school wasn't encouraged. I mean, my parents always wanted me to make good grades and stuff, but it wasn't like, We expect you to go to college, you know, nor did they have the money to send me. So it was kind of like, all right, this opportunity is here and maybe I need to think about this. But in a way, it was kind of more like, well, that's really nice that I got this offer from Berkeley, wherever, whatever the school is. But I didn't think much about it. And I was lucky enough to meet probably my biggest hero, actually, Alison Krauss at a pretty young age and get to know her and work with her quite a bit. And I remember kind of just mentioning something about Berkeley to her. And she was like, oh, Berkeley, that's an amazing school. Like, I've been up there. I know some of the folks up there. And she was like, you should go check it out. And I remember thinking, well, okay. She said, your career's still going to be here. It's not going anywhere. You could always go for a year. And if it sucks, come home, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. And so I thought, man, and I went up there and I I visited the school. I didn't quite realize that I was doing an audition for, you know, because they had said, well, you could have full tuition, but they told me about this thing called a presidential award. And that was a scholarship that included room and board as well, Mm -hmm. like food and all that. So I remember thinking, gosh, there's no way I'll get that. There's absolutely no way that I'll get the presidential award. There's way too many talented people But if for some crazy chance I got that, then maybe I'd just have to do it because I might just be dumb to turn down such an obvious opportunity that's like right here. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the presidential award rolled around and I didn't think I was going to start when I did, but I ended up starting that fall. And my Berkeley experience was different in that I already had a tour plan because I wasn't planning on going. There was a bunch Mm -hmm. of dates, but the school was just at the cusp of starting the American Roots program, which was part, I think, of why they were wanting me to come to school there. They couldn't have been more supportive. I mean, in my mind, I thought, I'm from this tiny little town in Birdstown, Tennessee, where I have teachers who have known about me playing music from the time I've been in third grade. And I went up to my teacher and was like, look at my calluses. I'm learning to play mandolin, you know, and Mm -hmm. got to play for my classmates. And like, they'd always, it's just this beautiful, supportive environment to grow up in. So of course, if I had an opportunity to like go record my album when I did, or maybe need to miss school a day or two here and there. My teachers were always so supportive and allowed me out of school and things like that, so long as I could get caught up. But I thought, I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to be like a tiny little fish in a big pond, and nobody's going to care. But they honestly, much to my surprise, were so supportive, really had a much deeper understanding of bluegrass and the community that I was coming from than Mm -hmm. I thought. Because in my Mm -hmm. mind, I just was like, oh man, I'm just probably not going to fit in here. Like I have no actual background and I'd never read music. Nobody said, oh, here's the first inversion of a G chord. Nobody talks about that stuff when you're growing up in bluegrass. (laughs) They just don't. Watch and learn, kid. Join our jam. Learn a thousand fiddle tunes. You sing harmony because that's what we do. You just learn to do it. And Mm -hmm. there's no discussion of it. Nobody tells Mm -hmm. you to warm up on arpeggios. For better or for worse, people get it out and just try to start shredding. There was a lot about going into that experience that definitely felt, oh my gosh, I'm a bit from a different world and it's like a bit overwhelming, but exciting too. So yeah, when people ask me about Berkeley, I'm kind of like, it was awesome, very intimidating. I feel like a lot of what I was working on went way over my head at the time because I just was like, ah, trying to keep up, but was so fortunate to have a real strong support system there with the school trying to make it something that I could experience, if that makes sense, coming from where I come from. And I'm so grateful for that. It set me up to go, oh, here's all this stuff that I hadn't thought about that's been thrown at me in a very short amount of time, maybe 10% of which I'm going to walk away actually making sense of. And Mm -hmm. then so much of it has caught up to me over the years since, Mm -hmm. you know, as Mm -hmm. I grow as a musician still. Yeah, I have that experience too, because I went to an art school for the last two years of high school. I went to a boarding school and then I went to four years of conservatory in New York. The art school that I went to was mainly classical orchestral based. And then I went to jazz school. 
and it's still to this day it's been like a decade since we graduated from more than that Um, (laughs) i know and i still like (laughs) you know there's still things that like will pop up all of a sudden i'm like Oh, that's what they were saying. Oh, that's what that means. Oh, okay, I got yeah. it. Yeah, and it's very exciting when you have those moments like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, hey, check this out. I've definitely forgotten so much stuff, so much ear training and oh, like yeah. modes and stuff. I teach a lot of music, and when people ask me certain things, and I'm like, I did know this at one time because mm-hmm. I was well-versed in jazz school, and now I have to go back and study it to be able to teach you. <laughs> but, yeah. but I will say, like, you know, you learn a lot through teaching, and teaching mm-hmm. has taught me a lot in that regard, too, where you go back to the drawing board and think about mm-hmm. things in order to explain them. But also, I think that there's a beautiful thing about also understanding that there's a lot of music being made out there by people who you can learn a lot without always having the vocabulary to put behind it. And I think Mm -hmm. the vocabulary is important, but there's a lot of people who have vocabulary, but don't necessarily have the heart and soul of making music to like do that side of things. You know, I think people sometimes go, oh, she went to Berkeley. So she just must be some like whiz. And I'm thinking, Lord, no. I mean, the guys in my (laughs) band could talk to you about the theory side of things like a thousand times faster and quicker than I can. And if you put a piece of music Mm -hmm. in front of me, like I kind of schlepped through it a little bit. I'm much further along than I was once upon a time, but I'm still at the heart of it. The bluegrass kid who just learned to play by ear and has learned to navigate my musical world that way, growing up not playing with drums or not playing with horn players or certain instruments. It's funny, I've toured with drums in my band the last few years. And do you know Mark Radabaugh by chance? I do. Yeah. Mark's a good friend. Yeah. yeah. So Mark's an incredible player and also one of those guys who ends up playing a lot with acoustic players. It's funny because like I mentioned, the string bands used to call me to play. And once Mark moved up here from Atlanta, like more full time, I was moving into being in the studio more. So I was like, oh, you should call Mark. Yeah. Like, call Mark. And now nobody calls me and everybody <laughs> calls Mark. So it's you're welcome, Mark. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> hilarious. But I always laugh. We were rehearsing the other day and I'm asking him to change something, but I'm still I always laughing. I'm like, look, Mark, you know, I don't speak drummer speak, you know, just like this thing, <laughs> like whatever on the symbol, like, can you just change that? Give me something lower or like a little quieter or like whatever, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And so those guys are good about putting up with my very organic way of discussing music, <laughs> I guess you could say. But I think there's a lot of different ways to do it, but having the vocabulary is a beautiful thing too. It does make the communication and the ease of things sometimes a lot easier to um, navigate. I think that's what's so beautiful about music though, is it also can be perplexing because there's so many different ways to understand it and communicate it. And therefore I feel like we want to be able to easily put people in boxes, but You can't do that with music because someone might be a virtuosic player who can hear something and be able to play it easily and not know at all what they're playing or be able to read any music. And that doesn't mean that they're less of a musician or on the flip side, someone might be able to really understand the technical theoretical aspect, but like their ear doesn't work as well. And it's just all these different ways of understanding the same language. Mm -hmm. And also as someone who teaches a lot, I feel like I get insight into all the different ways our brains work than the physicality of it. My first instrument was piano, but I'm not super practiced. So I can read music really well, but I don't have the physical facility that I used to have of being able to like actually play at the level that I could read it. And so there's all those different little things of like the way that our mind naturally works, how it's nurtured, and then like how we develop it and feed it. And I think, like you said, being really open and not determining like any judgment of it, what's better. Oh my gosh. It's funny. I play a lot with Bela Fleck. He says there's a joke in the Fleck tones between like him and Victor Wooten, you know, because they play a lot of songs and crazy time signatures. And I have a lot of tunes or things like that that I've written that wind up having maybe crazy time signature things. But I've usually just written it because I'm like, oh, this kind of sounds cool or this feels good to play. And then it's kind of like figuring it out on the post. It's not like I'm going, yeah, bro. And this one section's in seven. And then we're going to drop into like three, (laughs) four here. It's like my brain isn't thinking that way. It thinks like Mm -hmm. music first, what feels good, what sounds good. Sometimes then I'm like, piecing it together to understand like how to tell the band or the band's like on the flip side, helping me figure out whatever it is by being like, oh, it's this thing. And then Mark's like, well, actually there's like a beat of five there. I'm like, okay, cool. There's a beat of five there. And sometimes that can mean people can count things differently. Mm -hmm. If you're a counter, cool. Sometimes I'm like, I can through necessity sometimes. And as you get into like harder 
things to play. Sometimes it's inevitable. You got to get your count on. But like, that's not the first way that I think about music. Like oftentimes, if there's like a musical riff or something that I can tie into, I think more melodically rhythmic, if that makes sense, than Mm -hmm. more like numerical rhythmics. Listen, I'm even talking about this funny. (laughs) My rhythmics, you know? But the joke is, and so we've kind of adapted that in my band too. It's like, it don't matter how you count it. No judgment on how anybody counts anything or fills anything so long as you can play it. If you can get through it and you can learn it this way and it's faster for you to count this one bar in -hmm. fast bars or somebody wants to separate it in slow bars or like whatever it is, Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, our goal is to be able to play this thing and make it sound good and tight musical. So like no judgment there. So that's kind of the Bela Bela theory they have. So I'm like, okay, all right. I love that. I also think of rhythms as melodies. And that kind of came to me in college. My sight reading teacher for late drums was insane. And he was the kind of person that's like, oh, there's 24 hours in the day. So you can definitely practice for 23 of them, right? (laughs) Um, And, you know, the things that we had to sight read were insane. And that was like very much counting. Like your brain is steaming because it's like your final and it's half of your grade to read this insane thing. Like they put a piece of sheet music on a bug zapper and all these flies stuck to it and you had to read that. But I was in this class, it was like the Middle Eastern ensemble. And so we played like a lot of Turkish music and Syrian music on the page is like really complex rhythms and really complex time standards just changing all the time. And the way the teacher who was Israeli explained growing up with this music was hearing it rhythmically and hearing it like various ways, you know, and being able to convey that. And that just made way more sense to me. And it felt more musical and more fluid. Totally. Um, So I just wanted to second that. Funny enough, my sight reading teacher on drums was also Israeli. And so he approached it like very much counting, very much like a calculator. I'm like, I don't like math that much, you know, so I like. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Especially under the gun. Like, nope. I'm curious, I guess this is shifting gears, but being so rooted in the musical communal aspect of it as the foundation of your career, when you first started, you mentioned, you know, riding the the roller coaster of a career, the high highs and the low lows. When you first experienced any disappointment or challenge in the career aspect, how did you grapple with that? Was that jarring for you for the first time? Has it ever had any impact to feel a career disappointment? Has it had any impact on your musical relationship? And uh, what are some of the ways you've learned to cope with managing your response to the low times? I probably just write a bunch of depressing songs, you know, these days. But uh, (laughs) no, I mean, I think... I did start so young and I, you know, in hindsight, sometimes I look back at like how many things happened to me when I was a young kid that I'm like, gosh, you know, even like the multitude of heroes I got to meet or get on stage with or like cool opportunities Mm -hmm. that had I not done those things now, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'd still love to get to meet Alison Grouse or work with her, for example, or Chris Mm -hmm. Thiele or people like that that I met at such a young age. But like my dad was always very real with me about it, you know, in a way that like kept me super grounded and and realizing that this is always going to be a lot of work. And just because something really cool happens doesn't mean that you can just be like, okay, cool, I guess I can just like chill and relax now. Like it's about a life's work, really. And continuing that work amidst the highs, amidst the lows. A couple things that just pop into my head is I remember being maybe 10 years old or something like that and getting a little bit lazy on practicing. I mean, I loved it, but like any kid, you get distracted or you're just like wanting to do something else or whatever for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my brother was a musician as well, but my dad didn't push him quite as hard because my brother didn't really want it as a career. Like he wasn't like, this is what I'm going to do. And I think Mm -hmm. for me, it was always clear, this is what I want to do. And so I remember my dad saying, if you never learned anything else, you've already learned enough in two years of playing that if you want to be an old lady and sit on the front porch someday at like whatever, 75 years old, you can play music and music can be a fun part of your life. Something you can go to these jams, you can have fun. You probably wouldn't have to learn anything else. You can already play Mm -hmm. hundreds of tunes and whatever. If you want this like you say you do for a career, then you've got to keep working. It doesn't end, you know? He's like, right now you're 10 years old and everybody gathers around and says, oh my gosh, look at that cute little girl. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. and he goes, isn't she really good? And he goes, and you are really good for someone that's played two years, 10 years old. He goes, you're an impressive player. It's not that you've not worked hard up until now, but he goes, but someday you're going to be 16, you're going to be 18. And if you sound the way you sound now, 
and you're getting into adulthood, nobody's really going to care. They're not going to take mm-hmm. note. They're not going to be like, yeah, I need to call that girl to come play this mm-hmm. or do that. And he was like, and when you're 25, you need to sound like someone who's been playing since they were eight years old and working hard. Mm-hmm. And the journey doesn't really stop there. And so it was like really good advice. I mean, I remember him saying, one of these days, Allison Krauss is going to call you and you're not going to be ready. Because that was like my big dream to get to play with her. <laughs> and then she did. And she did, which is really funny. But And I knew a ton of the songs and I was stoked to be able to do it. But yeah, I think that you have those moments of disappointment. And a lot of times for me, I think it's usually resulted in, yes, the moment of like, oh, severely bummed. Yeah, I think I manage it better as I'm older, as we do, just Mm -hmm. kind of realizing, okay, I can't have my whole life crumble apart because I didn't have this happen when I wanted it to happen, or this didn't go Mm -hmm. exactly the way I wanted, or you have a bad show, which feels like a bad show to you, but probably to the crowd was great. Equally, when you think you have a great show and you're like, man, that was awesome. People are like, yeah, whatever. That was a fun, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So it's it's Mm -hmm. so relative to our emotional feelings at the time. I think I get a little better as I get older about not letting it wreck me for days on end kind of thing. But I Mm -hmm. think we're all just a bunch of sensitive people creative. So, of course, everybody wants to feel loved and appreciated and have people like what they do, or you want to get the gigs that you're setting out to get or have people show up or whatever it may be, you know, have good things happen with music you release or videos Mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, Charlie Worsham? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Not personally. I saw Charlie at an event the other night at the Country Music Hall of Fame, and he and my husband and I were just talking, and somehow I forget what brought it up, but he said something about, yeah, you know, doing this, it's kind of like our emotional selves is like a balloon that constantly gets aired up, and it's like floating higher and higher, and then somebody comes along with a pin every once in a while and just goes, and then you go sinking right back down, and then you like slowly patch it up a little bit until it starts to rise again, you know, and I thought that's so true. It's like the perfect analogy that I think most of us can at least relate to of those moments where you get real bummed and you feel kind of like, meh, for a little while and doing all this and working away at it because it is so much work, you know, hopefully passion-driven work, but still work nonetheless. And then something cool happens and you're like, oh man, that was awesome. And then you're like really pumped for a while until the next thing happens that you're kind of like, well, shoot, (laughs) okay. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it goes. So I think at this point, I've at least the value of having done it from a young age. Now it's like, trying to take that disappointment and fuel it into oftentimes working harder and going, Mm -hmm. okay, this doesn't make me better or worse than I was yesterday. The Mm -hmm. things I'm feeling right now, how much of our emotions are even really steeped in reality half the time? You know what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. like you're just, (laughs) just because in this moment, you're telling yourself all the negative things. I'm definitely that person that wakes up and four in the morning, stressing over something to do with my career because I care. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I've worked hard. Mm -hmm. So it's like, of course, that's going to come with it. But I've gotten better at being like, girl, stop it. This is dumb. You know, nothing's any worse or better in this second than it was yesterday when you weren't worried about this. So the best thing you can Mm -hmm. do is go stop it, go back to sleep and get up in the morning. It's a new day. Just get back to Mm -hmm. work, whatever that means. That's more so what I'm trying to tell myself these days. And also that it's okay to not spend my life worrying about my career or the things that I dream of. Because it's like, in a strange way, I think lately I've gone, does this mean I care less? And then sometimes that freaks me out. Mm -hmm. Like, am I just caring less? Or have I become complacent somehow? No, I don't think it's that. I think it's that I'm just maybe, hopefully, maturing in my emotions enough to go, what is real? Who am I? My whole Mm -hmm. thing doesn't have to be defined by this thing I do. And it's okay for me to love it and want to work hard, but it's also okay for me to remember all the other amazing things in my life and, you know, how good I've got it too. And Mm -hmm. great family and friends and other blessings that I have and not let this thing be just such a strong anchor in my life, whether I'm flying high or flying low, (laughs) sinking low, Yeah, if that makes sense. A hundred percent. That idea that anxiety and worry is your evidence that you're caring is such a strong idea that I think For those of us who do have a habit of worrying about things or having anxiety, I feel like that's the root of it. That feels like the root of it for me of like, but if I don't worry. I'm going to miss something. It's all going to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. It's all going to fall apart. I'm just going to be. And then years will slip by and I'll be like, what did I do? Exactly. But it's 
maybe not true either. Yeah. And if you have any sort of spiritual practice or mindfulness practice or even like religious, whatever it is, I feel like you can really dig into the idea of just being is okay. And that's the whole point. But because of the society we live in, and that's why you're such an interesting person to talk to, because like you said, you also reach so many high points at such a young age. Then you're like, what's in front of me next? I have to keep doing it. And it's been programmed in you, I would assume, oh, yeah. from observation. Sure. And I think the reason I love these conversations too, is I think it's so easy to look at people who are high achieving, especially people who are labeled as virtuosic children like yourself or like Chris Thiele and think, oh, Chris Thiele doesn't have disappointments in life. He just skates through life because he's just so naturally gifted. He's a genius and he just gets everything he wants. That's not it's true so at all. Not true. <laughs> it's so not true. I remember watching a Beyonce documentary several years ago and I was like, oh my God, everything she's saying like is what I feel. And I'm thinking <laughs> it's Beyonce. And I'm thinking like, of course, <laughs> It's all happening at a much higher scale. But the Mm -hmm. emotional angst one has is sort of the same from the creative standpoint. Obviously, I know there's, you know, the more successful you are, of course, the privileges that come along with that and not trying to lose sight of that and just be like, oh, we're all created equal in our Mm -hmm. anxieties. Because I know it's different if you're like, no, I'm stressed. I'm not going to be able to pay my bills, those kind of things. But it's like in terms of just wanting to be the thing you're meant to be from the creative side or the musical side, I think we all tell ourselves a lot of the same narratives, Mm -hmm. no matter how successful we are or aren't. And like you said, it's so easy to look at the other person and think that. How many times do we do that? And just be like, oh, that person just looks like everything's just going so great for them. And poor me, I'm over here just working hard. And Mm -hmm. this didn't go the way I wanted or whatever. We all feel those things. And it's good to remember that. Yeah. Hence why we want these conversations, because we all need these reminders. I'm curious about in a very male-dominated community, and then also in bluegrass music in general is still very male-dominated. And I read an interview with you where, you know, you get asked all the time about, what's it like being a woman in bluegrass? And that you, in the one interview I read with you, you said, you know, in general, you've had a really positive experience, but no, that's not the case for everybody. One thing I've been thinking about lately that I never really realized, when I think of like sexism in any industry or in the world, what comes to mind usually is discrimination of overtly like being pushed out or not allowed in or sexual harassment. But one of the things that I've only recently has been turning over in my mind is that dynamic of the loving fatherly relationship, where as a woman, you are seen as a daughter. And it might be really positive because you are genuinely cared for and concerned about and brought in under this. But I'm just so curious of what could be challenging about that as well, because you're still not being seen as a peer or in the same way as male colleagues. And I'm curious if that's ever come to mind, especially being a young, small woman starting out and how your dad said, yeah, you're cute. And so that plays into like, this is so impressive, how that has evolved for you in becoming an adult and that kind of like daughter image that could be beneficial, but could be challenging. And I could be projecting all of these thoughts onto you. So (laughs) No, no, no. I think it's something definitely I've thought about. It's funny. I catch myself being way more of a feminist (laughs) than I ever meant to be or thought I would be. So it's, of course, I'm all about strong female representation and seeing my female friends do well and noticing more in my adulthood when you look at a festival lineup and there's one female on the bill or there's, you know, like Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. still very often look up and go, okay, I'm the only woman in the room of 15 Mm -hmm. other musicians or one of two or three, you know. But yeah, I think it works the other way too. Whereas what you read in the interview, absolutely correct. I did grow up in such a positive environment. So I feel really fortunate that nobody ever said, oh, we're not gonna let this little girl get up here and play with us. Even when I could only just play chords, you know, like maybe Mm -hmm. chop some rhythm on the mandolin, like some of the elderly kind of at least in my mind, they definitely were a lot older than me at the time, like, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of local male musicians, let me get up and play. I didn't have Mm -hmm. to ask. They just welcomed me in that way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was really fortunate. Again, I know not everybody has that, but I also think it is true. Perhaps as a woman, you have to work 
twice as hard at certain things as they say to kind of earn the seat at the table. But I do think if you work really hard, a lot of times you're not denied in the same way, perhaps, that Mm -hmm. there is a certain amount of having to really earn your place. On the flip side, I'm very aware that it also can be an advantage sometimes because they might think, oh, well, we do need a female on this lineup. Who can we get? Okay, well, let's get Sierra. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. That's sometimes why you get the invite, but also knowing Mm -hmm. that when you do get that invite, that you show up prepared and ready to give it your all and your best and not trying to just use that as a reason to get the seat at the table. But Mm -hmm. being aware that, yes, sometimes, of course, things are going to come and maybe even trying to find a way to be proud of that, be proud to represent women when the opportunity is given. But yeah, I'm definitely more on the side of like, if I am being hired to do something, I hope first and foremost, I'm being hired to do it because somebody thinks I have something to offer more than like, oh, well, let's get the chick in the band or let's get the female on the bill. But I know it works both ways. And so I think there can be opportunities that you can make the most out of either way, because you never really always know what people's intentions are. But I have been really fortunate, I have to say, over the years of, you know, having people like Chris Thiele when I was 10 years old take time to jam with me at Merle Fest for an hour and a half backstage. Mm -hmm. Um, Or Sam Bush, same deal. Sit down and they didn't have to do that. I was just a young kid player that was a couple years into learning. It's not like I was just like anywhere on their league of playing, but yet they took time to do that. And that always meant a lot to me. And I think as a result, I never thought of it as a kid. I didn't really even think about it too much when I was getting on stage with the older male figures that I grew up around. It just kind of felt like, Mm -hmm. cool, these are my friends. And oh my gosh, of course I love, you know, my friend Lowell Logan's a great fiddle player and Ronnie Gilrith on the banjo. And of course, like, these are my buds. Almost more than even people I went to school with because I couldn't wait to go play music (laughs) on the weekends, you know? It was like, these are the people Mm -hmm. that I considered some of my dearest friends. And yeah, you just start to think about it later. But I do think it's probably in hindsight, I stand by the fact that to this day, Alison Krauss's music is still some of my favorite ever made. And it's like, I think I would have been drawn to it no matter what. I like to believe even if I was a dude, I would still be like, man, this is amazing. My husband's equally an admirer of her music. But I also do know that that probably had something to do with how much I was like, oh my God, here's this woman who plays fiddle like that. You know, I mean, she's an incredible fiddle player. A lot of people don't even think about the fact that she plays fiddle. But, you know, those of us who really love love the music and, and, you know, go shoot, equally incredible fiddler, but then sings like that too and leads her own band, having that kind of image in front of me or seeing Alison Brown on the cover of an album when I was a kid, those were the moments that I thought about it. Not when I was at the Mm. jam. Nobody at the jam Mm -hmm. ever gave me reason to think, oh, you're the only female. It was just when I would see that or I saw a Rhonda Vincent album cover Mm -hmm. and it was a woman holding a mandolin and it only dawned on me, I haven't seen that really. And I went and I went, I'm going to make records someday too. And that's going to be me someday. I'm going to be like 30, 40 years old. And it just kind of made me imagine myself as an adult and what that might be like to be an adult musician who gets to make records and seeing that. So I do think representation is so important because of that, because it allows young girls to see themselves in that way. 100%. I'll never forget having, when we lived in New York and I first started playing guitar, I had my guitar on my back and I went into a coffee shop and there was a dad and his son and this little boy looked up at me and went, why does she have a guitar? Girls don't play guitar. And I was like, oh no. Oh, <laughs> I didn't say anything. You're like, all right, dad, like, yeah. step in now, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's your teaching moment. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. The old phrase that everybody laughs, you're pretty good for a girl. Everybody's yeah. always mm-hmm. kind of jokingly been like, yeah, she's like my friend Ron Block and Allison's band who, you know, has been like a dear friend and mentor for years, you know, he'd always joke, go, yeah, you know, she's pretty good for a chick, just like teasing, you know, (laughs) because like, you know, he certainly grew up in a time where there were fewer women and less representation. And I know the women before me dealt with that way more than I've had to, you know, so it's been a tough road for a lot of the, the leading ladies of our acoustic scene. So I feel really grateful to kind of get to be on the hills of that and know that Mm -hmm. that probably a big part of why I've been able to have the experiences I have and had in many ways then be positive is because of that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about touring for so long and how do you have any 
routines or ways that you stay healthy while managing going in and out of being on the road and being home and and what that life is like? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I'm always trying to go, oh my gosh, how do I do better on the road? I love to eat. I'm not going to lie. I just love all things food. So it's just easy to want (laughs) to always scope out the good food and the good coffee. And I do think that's part of the joy of being on tour too, especially on a long tour, like a bus tour where you don't have your own vehicle. You're just in this tight quarters with people all the time. It's to be able to like get off a bus and go maybe even walk a mile wherever you're at to the coffee shop, get a good long walk in, have a nice coffee, come back. It's like as simple as that sounds. That's one of the things I really look forward to Mm -hmm. and how like good food and coffee and things like that kind of play into the joys of the road, but in terms of like also trying to, I bought a jump rope. And so I'm about to pack (laughs) that baby on tour with me coming up. I'm about to be in Europe for three and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of thinking, phew, this is going to be like a busy tour. And when you're gone that long and it's, there's Mm -hmm. so much going on, really trying to take care of yourself. It's hard. Coming off the holidays where, you know, been eating all the Christmas cookies and just picking out, you know, it's like, (laughs) you know, trying to find the things that are easy to both pack with you, travel with you, find those moments. But for me, yeah, lots of long walks when I can get that in because I found I need that. I'm a very social person. I thrive well being around people. So my husband is very quiet. He's somebody that definitely maxes out faster than me on like he needs his solo time. (laughs) And I love that he knows that. So he knows how to like protect his space and do what he needs to do in that regard. Whereas sometimes if I'm not careful, I'm just not even thinking about the fact that I do really need to carve out that me time. And so it'd be easy for me to just be like, honestly, I was at a festival down in Mexico this past weekend and it was fun. So I did a lot of talking. So my voice is like a little raspy right now as a result. Even that's not good. I've got to learn to take care of myself and not be, and of course, thankfully, I don't have anything. I got to do much for the next bit here in terms of Mm -hmm. like, you know, performing or whatever until we kick off at the end of the month. But like, it's the little things that kind of, at least for me, that creep up on me that I'm just, I have to be aware of because it's so easy to just be social, which can be taxing on your voice and realizing that you got to have time to get the quiet time in because it's Mm -hmm. so much more important than we realize even for us social types to be able to have time to really think and ground ourselves and like where we're Mm -hmm. at. I found on times where I'm so busy that if I'm not careful, it's just go, 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 long days, long day, long day, long day. And though my, I'm a pretty good road dog, like I usually can kind of get in there. I've done it long enough. I can handle uh, those rough days as I need to with fairly good spirits. But it's like you come home and you just realize, oh my God, I'm dead. I pushed it more than I should. Being mindful of it, I think for me, is one of the things I really have to remind myself when I'm out on a long run like that, because it's just so easy to wear yourself down. Yeah, I think it takes so much discipline and forethought because especially if you're someone like how you're describing I feel like I'm that way of like I get so hyper and excited by the fun of tour and being around people and talking like I lose my voice on tour because I can't not talk well, I know in the van. I know <laughs> like <laughs> it's bad but mm-hmm. like the last the very last tour that we did budding up to the pandemic shutting everything down was a three-week van tour, like down through Texas up to the West Coast. And it was like crazy long drives. There was five of us, like no TM. And I was selling merch. And like the schedule was just like insane. Of wake up super early, drive all day, like load in, like set up merch, sound check, play the show, then go sell merch, talk to fans, go to bed, get, you know, four or five hours of sleep. And I was just like, yes, this is amazing. And then we got back and everything shut down. And I was like, wait, that was like on the verge of exhaustion. Like, I'm a psycho. (laughs) What is this? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I think my, like, whole nervous system is like, you can't do that. (laughs) For real, though. I do think that as hard as it is for the introverted person to go on a long tour and to just be trapped in a van or bus or a lot of flying or whatever it may be, it's equally hard on those of us who thrive on it, too. At least from my experience being married to an introverted man, he, you know, was when it's too much. And he's like, nope, I'm going to go over here. And <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. not going to that show tonight. I'm going to chill and do my thing or I'm going to go do something that is very grounding to him. I'm the type that if I'm not being 
somewhat social. I also worry that I'm being rude or that somebody's going to think that I'm not happy and nothing like that. Or that I don't want to hang out with these people because we're all here together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get strange guilt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do too. If I'm quiet. Which I don't think Justin ever feels that. <laughs> he's not made that way. If anything, he's always telling me, it's okay, Sierra. You don't have to always reply to like every text or like always feel like you have to like go that extra mile you know what I mean he's like nobody's Mm. thinking that you're being unfriendly nobody's thinking but it's just a desire or the way I'm made up in a way I'm getting better at it I think the older I get of just being like you know nope I need to sit this one out because I need to take care of myself or nobody's concerned with what I'm doing they're doing their own thing how uh, egotistical of me to think that oh everybody just must think I need to be there or they're going to (laughs) be so stupid Mm -hmm. or they're going to think I'm being rude. It's like, no, they're probably like, whatever, (laughs) we're going to dinner. You don't have to join us. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. As somebody that is definitely more on the introverted or I get overloaded quickly, I guess, which took me a long time to learn. I basically got sober like in early 2018 and that like, especially being in Nashville, it's like such a drinking town. Like I lost so many friends and had to come to terms with like not wanting to go out every night. I was like, oh, I don't actually like this. But I see a lot of parallels between that, like feeling of like needing to engage, needing to be social, like all that with like not being able to let off the gas pedal on your career for a minute. I think it's like very parallel congruent anxieties of like, oh, no, I need to keep this going. And in my experience, it's like just kind of taking my hands off the wheel for a minute and realizing that like everything keeps spinning. Yeah. Was a really big relief. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Building in times to regroup as my mother said my entire life. She -hmm. would be like, no, Michaela, you can't go straight from school to this. You need to come home and regroup. And I'm like, what is this regroup? And now I totally get it. Now also having a child, I'm like, oh, she needs time to regroup. I was going to say, I'm sure like having the child be a part of that element too changes that dynamic in a way to really make you have somebody else to think about because it's just easy Mm -hmm. to kind of be like, well, of course I'm going to go do everything. (laughs) All the time. Mm -hmm. But you can be like, well, you know, actually, I can't because now I've got to do this. I've seen that with friends where there's a thing at play that's a bigger part of your life all of a sudden than what this Mm -hmm. career is. And kind of in a beautiful way makes you think about what am I really doing over here on the career side? And how can I maximize the things that I really care about? And sort of like let go of all the other things that are just taking up time that I don't necessarily need to be doing. And I don't have a child of my own, but I certainly feel like the older I get, I've started over the last two to three years, very much more like asking myself, why am I saying yes to this? And is this something I truly feel like is a good use of my time or something that I want to do? And why is that? You know, is it because I'm doing something because there's a friend that I'm doing something with and of course I'm going to do it? Is there something that's just an incredible opportunity I can't say no to? Is there a good financial opportunity that it's like, well, you know, of course I should say yes to this for all these reasons. I'm definitely somebody that struggles to say no. Again, the guilt Mm -hmm. creeps in and I feel bad, you know, of being like, I'm sorry, I can't do this or I don't have time. And I've had to learn to kind of balance that as well. But I've gotten a lot better at Mm -hmm. saying no over the last couple of years to things and being okay with it. And people understand. Nobody's ever been like, how dare you say no to this? People are like, oh, totally get it. You know, I'll circle back around later and we'll find an opportunity to do this or something. I was thinking about that in relation, you know, having to take every offer that comes across the table. I was thinking that in relation to like buying a car. Say I want to go buy like X car and the price isn't quite right. And so I come in and I make an offer. I'm like, I'll give you this much. And the dealer says, no, I don't want that car any less. I probably want that car kind of more, you know, even though they shot down my offer. I'm like, I still want that car. But like, it's so hard to see that when you're the one that's getting the offer and it's an offer for something that you love. I've seen it happen. Truly. You know, you say no to the festival that you wanted to play, but just went, I just don't think I should be adding more to my plate right now or whatever. And, you know, nine times out of 10, something better comes in its place or cycles around again the next year and maybe better than it was before or fits into your life schedule in a way that's more appealing or or like all those things. So I think trust in your gut on a lot of that stuff and being smart about it. That's definitely a big part of my life that I'm focused on right now. Yeah, that feels like a good place to be in. Yeah, and a good place to kind of wrap (laughs) this up too. (laughs) Yeah, we don't want to take any more of your time, but this has been so, I feel like the hour just whizzed. I have been known to be long-winded. We talk about, uh, you know, (laughs) talking too much. Oh, I loved this conversation. Yeah, Yeah. we really, again, we really appreciate you 
taking time out of your morning to chat of with course. us. Of course. Morning. It's afternoon, I, right? I know. Already. Can you believe it? Well, of course, I know you're snowed in. I'm snowed in. So it turns out this was a great time to hop on a podcast. Well, maybe sometime we'll all have to meet up at a Flower Your Dreams. They're so sweet. They're they are. really And they sweet. make great chai tea. I have not had the chai tea. It's homemade. It's Yum. really delicious. And their coffee's great. And yeah. their bread is great. Everything's good. Great. I know. Have you had yeah. their breakfast sandwich that they have now? Yeah. I haven't. Delicious. It's good. The yogurt bowl's good. So a couple, well, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, our bass player, Eric, we did a tour. I mean, it's funny. We do a lot of flying hopping in vans probably at least two or three times a year we'll do like a slightly longer bus run or something so we did a bus run Mm -hmm. like a couple falls ago and it was his first one out with us and he brought his espresso machine and like Mm -hmm. dude makes some good coffee you know he gets crema beans and like grind it right there so we joked and his last name's Coveny, so we'd be like, we call him Cove. So Cafe Cove would open at 9 a.m. every morning, you know, the bus. But yeah. it was like after about three weeks of just like Eric making this good coffee every morning on mm-hmm. the bus, I came home and Justin doesn't drink coffee at all. I was like, well, honey, I think I'm going to buy an espresso machine. <laughs> it's like yeah. one of my other yeah. ways to make coffee. It's hilarious for it just being me here. It's like, would you like a pour over? Would you like a AeroPress? Would you like a... Cappuccino. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of ridiculous. That's what our house is like. Got the, you know, espresso pump for the hard times where, uh, you know, yeah. you need the travel version. <laughs> our, <laughs> our daughter learned how to make espresso when she was 18 months old. Just from us, like, holding her. Because an espresso machine was, like, our first pandemic yeah. purchase. Which is a story all on its own. We were just jacked for, like, three months straight. Because we had to figure out how to make good espresso. She so, just so, tested it out. Um, but, yeah, before yeah. Georgia could even speak, she scoops she the, the beans, steps. grinds it. I have a video of her at 18 months old. Oh. Fully oh making gosh. me an espresso. <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> and she's still, we're like, oh, we're going out for coffee for something. And she go, why, mom? We have an espresso machine right yeah. here. Yeah, well, up. I will say it's pretty great. I say all that to say having a legit setup's been nice. So I don't really always run over there. But lately I yeah. told Justin, I was like, I just want to go over there and support them because I'm so stoked that there's a spot right there. I'm like, survive. survive and let's, you know, so I try yeah. to pop in there. Yeah. But yeah, we'll have to meet up there sometime for sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, Sierra, thanks again. This has been such a great conversation. Thanks for being so generous with your experiences. Oh my gosh, wonderful to chat with you guys. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you out somewhere on the road, perhaps if not around the corner. Yeah. All right. Take care. Have a great day. See ya. Hey, real quick before we wrap up today's episode, it takes a lot to produce even a small show like ours. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider taking a minute to check out our Patreon. There's a lot happening over there, all with the intent of growing our community and offering you more resources to navigate a career based on your art more sustainably. You can learn more at the link in the show notes below. Thanks for being here with us, and we'll catch you next time on the Other 22 Hours podcast.